Hello everyone and welcome back. Very excited today to present to you our final module, which is a continuation of motor learning. So we've covered several motor learning concepts and we're going to see a few more nuances. And then at the end of this section, we're going to look at a really nice theory, schema theory that connects everything we've learned about learning and generalized motor programs together. But first, uh, a smaller concept, and that's the power law of practice. And before we go into the data, what we're seeing here is that the more you practice, the less you learn. And at first that might sound strange, but if you think about it, think about uh, a 10 year old maybe who decides to learn soccer. They practice for a year and they're going to learn a phenomenal amount about soccer. They're going to know, uh, go from knowing nothing about soccer to all sorts of stuff. You know, how to play positions, rules, you know, how the game works. They're going to learn a ton in that first year. Now, if you think about that same individual, let's say they keep playing soccer and they're 25, maybe they're even a professional soccer player. And from 25 to 26, if we look at how much their soccer ability increases or how much their motor learning changes, it's only going to be a tiny amount. Uh, and that's what we see with learning. There's diminishing returns to our investment in time. So let me show you that with some data. And this is some nice data. It's hard, obviously, to follow individuals and measure their learning over their career. One way uh, they were able to do that is to look at cigar rollers and how long it takes them to roll a cigar. So it's not as common anymore, but there still are some uh, specialists in some places that roll cigars by hand. There are machines that do this, but it's kind of a, um, a luxury item uh, to have a, a hand-rolled cigar. And some of these individuals, this is what they do for their entire life. So uh, it's a little easier to, to find them every year, you know, go back to their, their factory where they're rolling cigars and, and look at their performance. And that's what we're looking at here is some data. So this is how long does it take to roll a cigar? And this is the number of cigars uh, that the individual has rolled. And a cigar roller rolls about 100 to 150 cigars uh, a day. So if we look at it, you know, early on in practice, not sure how many trials there's been here, it takes 25 seconds to roll a cigar. Maybe that's within their, their first year of, of learning this task. And then what happens is they quickly get better and better. So the time to roll a cigar gets shorter and shorter, but then you can see here it, it, it plateaus. And there are several reasons for this. Um, one is that it's hard to get that much better at rolling a cigar, just like it's hard for LeBron James to get that much better at basketball. But for these elite performers like a cigar roller or LeBron James, these tiny improvements in performance can be significant at their level of competition or for these you know, master cigar rollers. So if we look at this data, we can put it here on a logarithmic scale so we can see these time changes a little bit easier. So uh, when a cigar roller has had uh, produced uh, 10,000 cigars, it takes them about 25 seconds to roll a cigar. And then if we look, okay, they've got 900,000 more trials or a, a million total trials of practice, and it's taking them about, let's say, nine seconds to roll a cigar. Well, if you look at the change from uh, 1 million cigars to 10 million cigars, you know, 10 times the amount of initial practice, there's some improvement, but you can see it's very small. You know, they've gone from nine seconds to maybe seven and a half seconds. And that improvement in performance, that's what we, we see when we invest time into learning skills. The amount of learning gets smaller and smaller and smaller. In some ways you can think about it as there's not that much left to learn or in another way, there's capacity limits on our human performance. You know, we're not robots and we can't get this time down to zero, for example. So that we call the power law of practice. And we also see the same sort of thing if you're studying for a class. So if you put in, say, 10 hours to study for a test, if you hadn't studied, maybe you would only get 50%. You put in 10 hours, maybe that bumps you up to a 70%. Well, if you put in another 10 hours, what you probably wouldn't see is your grade go up the same amount, say from 50 to 70 and then 70 to 90. If you put another 10 hours, there's gonna be diminishing returns. So you might go from a 70 to an 80. 
Put in another 10 hours and you're probably not going to go up 10% again. Maybe you only go from 80 to 85. So the power law of practice, it's, it's the mathematical re relationship we see with skill acquisition over long periods of time. And that's these large increases at the start of practice. Uh, and I don't mean um, each day when you practice, but over your career of practice. So large increases early on in the career of a cigar roller or huge increases in practice when LeBron James in his first year of playing basketball. And these get these improvements get smaller and smaller uh, the more the individual practices. So you can imagine LeBron James, you know, I'm not sure how many years he's played basketball now, uh, but if he puts in one more year, you know, maybe there's a tiny improvement in performance. So how can we apply the power law of practice? And one way is with constrained induced movement therapy, which is sometimes abbreviated CIMT. And this is something that's seen in physical therapy. Now, let's think about the most common way it's used, and that's in stroke rehab. So often when you have a stroke, uh, one side of your body is more affected than the other. So let's say, uh, <laughs> check this, my left arm. So my left arm, let's say it's relatively unaffected, and my right arm has been hampered by the stroke, and they call that your paretic arm. Now, what's tempting in this case, you can imagine you wake up one day with a good arm and a bad arm, you're probably just gonna use your good arm because it's much better than your bad arm. But the problem with that is if you don't use your bad arm, it's never gonna get better. And what we need to see is extensive practice with our bad arm. Um, initially, we'll see large improvements in performance, but we need to continue practicing. There'll be diminished returns that we need to keep investing time to get that arm back up to its uh, previous capability or at least uh, some sort of satisfactory level of function. So what is CIMT? Well, it's kind of funny, it's a fancy name, but it's really putting you know, something like an oven mitt on your good hand and that forces you to use your bad hand. <laughs> so it's kind of a constant reminder, no, don't rely on your good arm, uh, use your bad arm and you put in a ton of practice. There'll be diminishing returns, but we're gonna force you to keep practicing to uh, improve its function. Now I've been critical on some other types of uh, science or pseudoscience, so it's only fair that we look at you know, the evidence for conduced, constraint induced movement therapy. This is a meta-analysis and uh, at, at the end here it says, uh, kind of a conclusion, these meta-analyses findings indicate that evidence for the superiority of constrained induced movement therapy in comparison with other rehabilitative interventions is weak. Information on the optimal dose of constrained induced movement therapy and optimal time to start constrained induced movement therapy is still limited. So at first this doesn't sound so good, but there are some good things in here. So first of all, in these studies they have compared CIMT to typical therapy. And with medical research that has to be done. If you invent a new drug, you can't just say, hey, does it work better than nothing, unless there's no drug currently available. You need to show that your new drug is better than the typical drug. In this case, is CIMT better than regular therapy? And it's saying that there's weak evidence that CIMT is better. Um, so if it was just as good as normal therapy, that's in a way okay. And there's some evidence that it might be a little bit better, and that's helpful. The latter part here is a reality of doing studies in the real world. A lot of the research I do is fairly reductive. We try to isolate one thing, we study it in the lab. In the real world, things are far more complicated. So it says information on the optimal dose of CIMT. So how long should you wear the oven mitt? And the optimal time to start CIMT, should you start this the day after your stroke, a week later, a month later? Uh, when is the best time? And they say the evidence is, uh, for this is limited. And that's really a practicality because if you wanted to study CIMT, ideally you would get 100 or 1,000 people that have the exact same stroke. Now that you know, probably never happens. It's like trying to find 1,000 snowflakes that are the same. Everyone's stroke is a little bit different. So we're, we're losing control on an aspect of the study.
The other thing is, ideally, we'd want to say, okay, well, we'll get people with similar strokes, and with this one group, we'll have them start therapy a week later, another group, we'll have them start a month later, and then we can see, you know, which is better, a week later or a month later. And that's a fairly good design, but it might not work out in reality, because individuals will always vary in their adherence to those uh, protocols. You know, maybe someone uh, who starts at one time, they then go on vacation for a week, and on vacation they don't do their therapy. Uh, there could be many reasons that people don't stick to the schedules, and you know, people aren't trying to uh, ruin research, it's just uh, difficult to, to follow these set schedules. So that's why the evidence uh, is, is likely limited for these things because it's very hard to nail down uh, those sorts of details and studies. So that's a little bit about the power law of practice. And now I'd like to look at uh, two topics. One, how well do we retain motor skills? And then the second one is how well do motor skills transfer from one situation to another? And there's kind of two aspects within there that we'll get to. But first, retention. So you may have heard the saying that you'll never forget how to ride a bike. So is that true? Well, there's a very good study that actually looked at that very question. Now, instead of doing a study where they brought people in, looked at their bike riding ability, and then waited 10, 40 years later and looked at how well they could still ride a bike, there's a few reasons that's difficult. One, you'd have to keep track of people for a very long period of time. And two, you wouldn't be able to control how much they ride uh, a bike in that intervening period. And ideally, we don't want people to ride a bike for 40 years and we wanna see uh, whether they've forgotten. And it might be too, ma uh, too much to ask people to you know, never ride a bike again. <laughs> so what they did in this study is, first of all, they didn't have quite as long a timeline. They did look at a two-year gap in training, uh, which is still a fairly impressive study. If I had all of you come into the lab and do an experiment and tried to find all of y'all again in two years, I think it would be impossible. You know, maybe some of you I could find, um, almost all of you would probably have graduated, who knows where you are, um, you know, would you come back to Lubbock to do a silly study? Would I have the budget to fly out to wherever you are and have you do, you know, this silly study? You know, probably not. So these are, these are difficult studies to do when they're over a long period of time. So for time, they just looked at two years. I don't know exactly what they did to make this feasible, but I'm guessing maybe they tested uh, freshmen. And then, you know, two years later, they're probably, most of them still at the same institute, so they could convince them to come back into the lab. Uh, the second aspect to handle um, whether participants, uh, to ensure participants don't practice the task outside the lab, is they came up with a novel task that shares overlap with riding a bike, but it's something that people can't practice at home. And this is the Mashburn task. And it, it's fairly old and it doesn't really seem to be used anymore. So unfortunately I couldn't find a video of it, but you can kind of think of this as like aiming a fighter pilot. You're sitting in this chair and on the, the screen, uh, there's a dot moving around and you need to keep your crosshair over that dot. So think about like a fighter pilot and you're trying to aim at, a, a, at an enemy airplane. And the way you aim is to move the uh, cursor in one direction, you press these uh, foot pedals in and out, and to move the cursor up and down, you pull this lever uh, forward and backwards. So how is this like biking? Well, it's a continuous task. So as you bike, you know, you're always steering, you know, following the line on the road or the bike path. And in the mash burn task, also you're you're continuously making these small adjustments to track uh, the target on the screen. Another good thing about the mash burn task is this um, doesn't really rely on any physiological change, whereas riding a bike, there are elements of it uh, that re require cardiovascular endurance. So a little bit different, but hopefully uh, a, a better controlled uh, proxy than riding a bike, and but could still be applied to that context. So here's the study. Look at me, look at my notes here. 
So this, it's not a super hard task, like learning to ride a bike is probably harder because it, it involves a lot of dynamic balance. Here, you know, you can't really fall out of the chair, it's just the tracking task you're learning. So they gave participants 17 days of practice, and most motor learning studies, I'd say people come in three times, so they do three days of practice. So already this is a better study than average. So participants practice this task for about five hours total, which is pretty good. And here we can see their performance. So we're looking at an error score here. So the higher the score, the, the worse you are at tracking the target. And what you can see is early on at practice, participants are bad at the task and their performance improves uh, with practice, which makes sense. People are uh, learning this task, they're getting better. Then what they did is they split the participants into three groups. The first group, they asked them to come back after nine months the second one after a year, and the third group came back after 24 months. So they're trying to see what is retention like over you know, nine months to two years. So here's the retention interval, and this is you know, much longer than most studies because we wanna know, you know, will you never forget how to ride a bike? And again, you know, we didn't, they didn't track people down 40, uh, 40 years later, but it's pretty impressive to find people two years later. Most motor learning studies, if they do retention, it's a day later. So you know, this is far more impressive than that. And the interesting thing, when they looked at retention, and again, this is our best measure of motor learning, performance uh, and, and learning now in this case was very similar to performance at the end of retention. There's a visible increase here, but I don't actually think it was significant. So what they showed here is that uh, they kind of proved the concept or the adage that you'll never forget how to ride a bike. Once you practice this task and get good at it, even if we bring you back two years later, you're still good at it. You know, they didn't see that participants, you know, got significantly worse or, or returned to, to baseline. No, people retained this task even over 24 months. Would this happen over 40 years? You know, hard to say, that's a very difficult study to do. Uh, but maybe that, you know, that could be your PhD. Ooh, that'd be a long PhD. <laughs> maybe that could be your, uh, your, your lifelong research study. <laughs> so what they showed here was for a continuous task, something like bike riding or continuously tracking a target uh, in the, the mash burn task, or you can't see mine, but I've got my legs out here to hit the pedals. Uh, retention is extremely good. And they've done other studies with other continuous tasks, and they've, sh they've shown similar results in those, incredible uh, retention. Now, if we look at the other end of the spectrum of motor skills, we have continuous skills and we have discrete skills. So a continuous skill or task the idea is that it begins and then it goes for a long time, there's some subjectivity there, and then it ends. So biking, for example, uh, swimming, running, you know, there's a start, there's an end, there's a long period in between. Discrete skills in sports might actually be more common. Again, there's a start and an end, but the idea is there's a short period of time in between. And baseball has, has uh, lots of these. So think about a softball pitcher, you know, they start the pitch, they end the pitch, and there's you know, a second uh, between the, the beginning and the end. Or the batter, they begin to swing, you know, they end their swing, short seconds you know, between those two events. So how well do we retain discrete skills? In this study, we're gonna see another kind of odd task, and this one's maybe even further away from, uh, so in the previous experiment, you know, the mash burn task was kind of like bike riding, yeah, the task we're going to see here doesn't really look like anything from baseball. And I've tried to find some better examples, but uh, this is a landmark study, it's very foundational, and it, it's really got the best uh, data. But the principles from this do apply to uh, discrete motor skills that are more sport-like than what we're going to see here. So what was the task? Well, participants came into the lab, and in front of them was a board, and it had eight buttons on the inside and eight buttons on the outside. And what they were told is that you would press first a button on the inside, and you had to guess which button it went with on the outside. So the participant know, didn't know, but there was a mapping, a correct mapping between inside and outside buttons. 
So if we look at the 12 o'clock button, the correct button to press on the outside after you press this button is the button at 6 o'clock. So to figure this out, participants just had to guess. So imagine a participant comes in and maybe you, know, you could pick any of the inner buttons, but maybe we'll run with this uh, 12 o'clock example. They press this one, and then maybe they decide to press the 12 o'clock on the outside ring, and they would get a, a you know an unhappy tone and says, nope, that was not the correct one. And now they're welcome to guess another one, and you know you could pick any other one uh, to go with, but if you want to figure out what this is, you might want to be a little strategic with it. So maybe you pick this one. And you know you could pick uh, any of these. Maybe you'd go in a clockwise manner, or maybe you happen just to guess correctly and go with the the six o'clock one. And then, bing, you know you'd get a happy tone. Yes, that's a correct match. So it's a discrete motor skill where you press two buttons, start, stop, short period in between, and you're also trying to remember uh, the the buttons on the inside, uh, which ones on the inside go with the ones on the outside, and you have to figure out all eight mappings. Here's performance on the task. And the way it worked is you had to keep doing the task until you got it uh, correct twice in a row. So you could do all eight of the inner buttons with the outer buttons um, sequentially all in a row correct, and then do it again so you get eight out of eight twice in a row. So you can see if we look at the very start of practice, on the very first trials, participants, you know, they, they did horribly. And that's because they didn't know the mapping. That's what they had to, to learn. So their performance is about one out of eight, and that's what you'd expect from guessing. So if you guess on uh, a A to E multiple choice, you know, uh, if you're just guessing, you know, you should get 20% or, or one out of five. And here, if you've got eight options and you just guess as they were, then you should score about one out of eight. But participants did learn this discrete skill. You can see with more and more trials, they got better and better. And on average, it took 63 trials for participants to be able to do this correct twice in a row. So they said, okay, uh, they're, they're learning to a criterion. They said, okay, take a break, retention, and we're gonna bring you back to the lab and see whether you've retained this discrete skill. We are gonna see long-term retention like in the last study, but they actually split the participants up into several groups. So one group, they actually just said, okay, come back in one minute and try the task again. So very, very short retention. And you can see here, there's that one minute group. You know, they came back and they again said, okay, how long will it take you to get this correct twice in a row? And they could do it right away. So this group, they have retained what they learned after a one minute break, maybe not surprising. But check out our next group, 20 minute break, bring them back and look, we already see some evidence of forgetting. They do not start out perfect. You know, they're getting seven out of eight. So they, they have retained some of their knowledge, but they've also lost a little bit. And it takes them one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, six trials to get back to the same performance, um, eight out of eight twice in a row that they saw in the previous block. So the first thing here is this is very different than riding a bike where after two years you seem to retain all of your abilities. With the discrete skill, you take 20 minutes off and you've already lost or forgotten some of that motor skill. And it only gets worse the longer the retention interval. So here this is two days later, seven weeks later, and this is uh, most comparable to the retention in the previous study one year later. And look how horrible this group is they're back to performing at chance, one out of eight. Now you might think they've forgotten everything because they're back to being as bad as they were when they had never done this task before. This we don't necessarily see for all discrete skills. So if you're a baseball pitcher and you take a year off, yes, we see evidence of, of forgetting, but you don't necessarily forget everything you learn. This is, you know, this is a little bit of a weird task and that may be why performance drops so, um, so low in this experiment. But have they forgotten everything? No, they haven't. We can see some evidence for that. So remember that initially it took them 63 trials to get two uh, eight out of eight trials in a row. Well, what they did after they brought this group back after a year is they had to keep practicing 
uh, until they got back to getting two trials, uh, eight out of eight in a row. And see, now it only took them 36 trials. So initially it took 63. How long did it take for them to, we could say, relearn or remember this task? Well, it only took them 36 trials. So that's evidence of some retention of the discrete skill. If you were once a baseball pitcher and you try to do it a year later, it's not gonna be completely gone, but you're gonna be fairly rusty and you're gonna to have to remember or relearn uh, that skill. And that will occur rapidly, much, for, much faster than it initially took you to learn that skill. So across these two studies, we see a very interesting difference. First, great retention of continuous motor skills, and that's contrasted with poor retention of discrete motor skills. And this has been seen over and over in even you know, more sport-related tasks. So if you think about the adage, it's true, you will never forget how to ride a bike, but you can throw in here, you know, you will forget how to hit a baseball or throw a baseball or throw a football, for example. So let's look at our second topic here. And this is the question of how well do motor skills transfer from one situation to another? And let me give you two situations or reasons why this is important. So first of all, if you think about a football player, they practice, right? They go to practice and then later on they have a game. And the idea is that practicing will make them better at the game. And this is kind of obvious because, you know, why would we practice if it didn't make us better in the, the game situation? Uh, and it does. Practice does uh, make us better in the game. But what can we do to optimize the amount of learning that transfers from practice to the game. You know, how can we invest our time in practice uh, in the most efficient manner? And with all of us, you know, we only have so much time. And with elite athletes, uh, this is even more of a predicament uh, because you could say, well, um, the, the, the uh, professional football player, you can practice all day. Well, there's also a limit to, you know, how much practice your body can take before, you know, you're going to break down and be injured. So we only have so much time we can practice. You know, we're only awake for so long. Our body can only take so much. And we want to be able to do that in the, in the most efficient manner to progress as quickly as possible and have the best performance in the game. So we'll look at that situation first, but we'll also try to look at the idea of transfer from one context to another. And an example of that is Michael Jordan. So Michael Jordan, phenomenal basketball player, thinking won six NBA championships with the Chicago Bulls. Um, but there was a period between his, so he won three, took a little break, and he played baseball for a year. Played uh, minor league baseball, so fairly high level baseball. And then after doing that for about a year, he then came back to the Chicago Bulls and won another three championships. So in this context, how much learning of, of Michael Jordan's basketball transferred to baseball? So we'll look at this first example uh, with some data and from that data we'll also extrapolate to this, this other situation, the, the more bizarre or maybe in some ways more interesting situation. So to understand transfer, we need to understand positive and negative transfer. So positive transfer is good, negative transfer is bad. And we'll show this with some, some hypothetical data. So think about a control group, group two, and what we do is they're gonna be tested on task B. So beforehand, they don't do anything, then we test them on task B, and we're gonna see how good, they, how good are they at task B. Now groups one and three, we're gonna look at transfer. Group one is gonna practice task A, and then, just like the control group, we'll test them on task B. And what happens, uh, you know, how does task A transfer to task B? Does it make them better at task B, that's positive transfer, or does it make them worse at task B? That would be negative transfer. And we'll look at the same thing for uh, group three. They're gonna practice something else different, task Z, and then they'll do task B. So all three groups are doing task B, and we wanna see 
which group is best at task B. Or in other words, how does practice on task A or Z transfer to subsequent performance on task B? So here's our table to remind us what's happening. We're not looking at performance on task A or Z. What we're looking at is that subsequent performance on task B. So here's our control group, group two. They start task B and whatever they're doing here, it takes them about 60 seconds. And as they keep practicing it, they get better and better and better. So that's our control. What if we look at group one? Well, group one, they got to do A first and then they did B and notice that they start off far better than group two. So this is positive transfer. Whatever they did on task A helped them be good at task B. So this is positive transfer. Now group three is the opposite. So compared to the control group, when they start doing task B, they're worse. This is negative transfer. Whatever task Z was has interfered with their performance on task B. So if you had the option of how would you practice to be good at task B, your best option would be to practice task Z first, because then when you later practice task B, you're gonna show positive transfer. So that's hypothetical data, but let's look at this in a real task. Again, we have the pursuit rotor task, which used to be somewhat common in uh, motor behavior research. And we've got uh, three groups. One group is gonna do, everyone does pursuit rotor, but one group will do it at 40 RPM. So the light moving around goes relatively slow, 40 rotations per minute. Another group will practice at 60 RPM. So the light's gonna go faster, that's gonna be harder. You know, you're trying to keep up with this light, it's more difficult. The third group, they're gonna have the hardest version of the task, the light's gonna go at 80, and they're gonna to try to, to track it. So different initial practice, and we're gonna see how does this transfer to doing the task at 60 RPM. So on day two, everyone is gonna do the task at 60 RPM. So that's actually retention for group two, because initially they did 60, and then on day two, they'll still do 60, retention. But for groups one and three, it's transfer, because they're gonna go from 40 or 80 to 60 on day two. Now, if you think about this, I think you could logically argue for why each of these three groups would be better. So maybe you'd say, okay, well, if you wanna learn 60, maybe you should start out easier. You're gonna learn the basics, then you'll do 60, and you know, slowly easing into this task may be the best for learning. Or you might say for group two, they're gonna be the best. Because if you wanna be best at 60, then just practice 60, because it's the same thing. Or you could say kind of the opposite of group one, well, if you wanna be good at 60, if you practice 80 really hard, and they say, hey, can you do 60? Well, that's even easier. So it, it, because you're used to doing something harder, maybe that makes the, the transfer task seem easier and then you're better. But what does the data say? We're gonna see a clear answer to, to how we should uh, practice to transfer our skills. So first off, acquisition. So we've got our three groups. They're practicing the easy task, the medium task, or the hard task. And there's a big difference in performance and that's because you know, the 40 RPM, RPM task is way easier than the 80 RPM task. So it makes sense that these groups have very different initial performance. So here, uh, this is time on target. So the higher the score, the better. You know, 100% up here would be perfect. We can see the 40 RPM group, not uh, the easiest version of the task. And with a bit of practice, their performance is really high. 60 RPM, well, it's even harder. So they start lower and with practice, they get better their performance improves, but they're not uh, performing as well as the 40 RPM group. And for the 80 RPM group, we see the, you know, the same trend, but even worse performance. And that's okay. What we really want to see is day two, when everyone does 60, who is the best at 60? So let's look at the group that go, starts with 60 practice and then transfers to 60. So they're doing the same thing. This would be a retention test. And we can see they basically pick up where they left off and they you know, keep improving on this task uh, with, with more practice. So this is the best performance. If we look at our other two groups, they're doing worse. So if you wanna be good at 60, 
you should practice 60 because when we transfer you or when you do retention from 60 to 60, you're doing better than the groups who practiced, uh, let's see, 60, oh no, uh, 40 or 80. <laughs> okay, let's look at these groups a little closer. So here's the 40 group. So you have an easy task, you're really good. We transfer you to 60 and boom, you know, your performance just falls. And most importantly, is it falls lower than our control group that went 60 to 60. What about 80? Well, you're practicing something really hard, so your performance is low. Now we say, okay, how good are you at 60? Your performance increases, but you're not outperforming the 60 to 60 group. The interesting thing here is that this is kind of poor transfer. If you think about compared to retaining bike riding, where retention was amazing, here we see poor transfer from 40 or 80 RPM to 60. So these two groups here, you know, their initial performance at 60 is much lower than this group uh, who practiced 60 and then looked at retention at 60. The interesting thing about this is this is poor transfer even when we see a change to the parameters of your generalized motor program. So if we looked at these tasks, we have you do it slower or faster, we would see the same invariant features. The only thing that's changing are the parameters. So you track slow, you have a, a long overall duration, or you track fast, uh, and you have a, a shorter overall duration. So you would think that transfer would be pretty good here, but it's not very good. There's a big difference in 60 to 60 versus 40 or 80 to 60. And if you say your final exam was based on your performance on 60 RPM, what should you practice? Well, practice 60 RPM. Don't practice 40 or 80 because transfer is, is not that great. Now, are we seeing positive transfer or negative transfer here? Well, we can see that in the data. If we look at the initial performance of this group, so they, uh, this is what your performance looks like if you've never done 60 before and you practice it. So that is kind of our threshold. Anything above this would be positive transfer. Anything below it would be negative transfer. And the good news here is that practicing 40 or 80 does show positive transfer. We're above this line. We're better than the group who started with 60. So, you know, thankfully, practicing 40 or 80 doesn't cause negative transfer, but it's not as efficient as just practicing 60 and then retaining 60. They've shown this with more you know, motor-related tasks, more sport-related tasks. And the importance here of how we can apply this to how athletes, musicians, dancers should practice. What we see generally is the amount of transfer depends on the similarity of the task. And if you want to be good at 60, you, know, you should practice 60. Same generalized motor programs, same parameters. And that's why in sports, when athletes practice, What's ideal is if they practice exactly like the context that they're gonna see in the game. And one way to do this is to have a, an inner squad scrimmage. So make it as game-like uh, as possible. Now, if you make practice different than the game, if the, the parameters of your generalized motor program change, then you're not gonna transfer as much. So if we think about baseball, Let's say you do batting practice. Ideally, you would face a pitcher from your team throwing like he would in a game. So that sort of practice will lead to the best transfer to the game. If the pitcher instead says, ah, oh, you know what, I'm gonna uh, throw it half speed and I'll always throw it in the same spot. Or maybe, you know, you do batting practice against a batting machine. There is some value to that. You are practicing your batting generalized motor programs, but it's different parameters. It's a slower swing. And because of that, you know, what you might think is a small difference, you're not gonna transfer as much to a game scenario. So generally, we wanna make practice as similar as possible to the performance situation. There are times where we might stray from that. Um, so maybe you're not trying to learn the motor skill per se, but you're trying to build up an athlete's confidence then it might be helpful to have them bat at half speed because they're gonna see really good performance. Uh, but generally, 
to optimize transfer, we want to practice as similar as possible to game or performance uh, situations. Few other applications to that within industry, when they look at training uh, pilots, ideally you would put them in planes, you know, send them up and practice. Uh, but <laughs> that can be risky if you've never flown uh, a plane before. You might not want to take that that big leap. Uh, it's also costly. You know, flying a, a plane is expensive. And let's say you want to practice something uh, dangerous, like landing during a lightning strike or with one engine out. That well, you might not be able to achieve that. It might not be safe to practice that. And that's where these simulators come uh, into play. And they have very realistic simulators. Um, so this one's you know, on these hydraulic la legs that will move uh, the same way the airplane would to make it as similar as possible to the actual in-flight experience, to optimize transfer. Now, can you practice flying an airplane with, you know, Microsoft Flight or a program like that with a, you know, a joystick at your computer? Yes. And you will learn from some from that situation, but not as much will transfer from that to flying a real airplane as it would for these super realistic flight simulators that really make sure that you're using the same generalized motor programs with the same parameters. You know, to me, this looks just like a real cockpit. You know, it, it, if I didn't know it was from a simulator, I would say that's just pilots flying an airplane. But this is an actual uh, simulator, and actually b behind them, this is the individual kind of controlling the simulation. So if he wants, you know, he could uh, put some parameters in here, like, "Ooh, let's have lightning strike the left engine and see how uh, these pilots perform." So when we look at transfer of motor skills. Uh, what we see is that the amount of transfer depends on the similarity of the parameters. We want to make the parameters as close as possible um, to optimize transfer. Now what about this other situation where we've got you know, Michael Jordan going from basketball to baseball? Well here, this isn't a change in parameters. If you think about a three-point shot and a baseball swing, those are different generalized motor programs. And here we see practically no transfer. Um, but why was Michael Jordan actually pretty good at baseball after all this basketball practice? And it's not his motor learning that's transferring here, but it's other things uh, like physiological change. So as a competitive athlete, you know, he's got a great cardiovascular system, and that's also helpful in, in, in baseball. Maybe not to the same extent as we see uh, the, the cardiovascular demands on basketball players versus baseball players. Also, he's fairly muscular. You know, basketball involves um, arm, leg movements, you know, so does baseball. And the musculature in one sport is helpful in another sport. So although we see practically no transfer of motor learning from one sport to another, we do see physiology transfer. And remember, that doesn't fall into our definition of motor learning. One last example of transfer here, and a lot of products are marketed to athletes, uh, the, uh, suggesting that if you do this, you know, you'll get the edge. And I think this is very tempting for athletes because they're looking for small improvements in performance because those are me very meaningful uh, to them. Uh, think about a 100 meter sprint. If you increase your time by milliseconds, you know, that uh, can, can change whether you're on the Olympic team or not on the Olympic team. And one example of one of these products is uh, Dynavision. Uh, this is something um, that at one of my prior universities they had in a physical therapy lab, uh, which kind of makes more sense to use it in that context, but it's also marketed uh, towards athletes. Let me see if I can find my, my quote here about Dynavision. So uh, it says right here, the DynaVision D2, so it's this board, has been recognized as the premier attention task recorder for reporting accurate eye-hand coordination measures as well as visual motor reaction times for over 25 years. Okay, that's not the quote I wanted. <laughs> well, let me just tell you about this task. What happens is you're standing in front of this board, one of the buttons illuminates, and you need to press it as quickly and accurately as possible. And one way they sell this is for, for rehab, which actually I think is... Uh, 
uh, a pretty good use. There's probably research to support that. But another way, uh, the original way they sell it, and they still uh, sell it, is to improve athlete performance. And they say, for example, for a football player, that doing this task will, get, uh, will improve your ability to avoid blindside hits, to read the field, and those are all beneficial things, that they sound uh, pretty good. And on their website, they have, for example, testimonials. So this is from uh, a goalie coach out of, out of Alberta at a very elite school. So it says, an elite goaltender must excel at hand-eye coordination, peripheral awareness, cognitive processing ability, visual reaction time, decision-making under stress, and concentration under fatigue. And I think I agree with that. The Dynavision trains this and so much more. Goaltenders that train on the Dynavision track pucks better, have the ability to read the plane more consistently, react to rebounds faster, have improved focus, increased field of vision to see opposing players and perform better under stress. And that sounds good. <laughs> you know, if I were uh, a young, you know, just sub-elite goaltender going to this school trying to make that next step, and the, the head coach says that this is what happens, that sounds fairly convincing. But we need to remember that that's not research. And motor learning research is very difficult. Remember, we need retention or transfer tests to differentiate performance from learning. And this coach um, probably hasn't done that. You know, maybe he has, but I think this is just his uh, opinion or, or what he has seen. So what does the research say? And uh, Dynavision, they actually have quite a few research articles on their website. And there are some very poor ones, and there are some slightly better ones. And this is maybe one of the best. There's some fundamental issues with a lot of the studies, but this one has, you know, ticks a lot of the boxes. And let me, let me tell you a little about the study and what they found. So here, uh, they looked at youth field hockey players, and one critical thing they had was a control group. So probably half the team didn't do Dynavision training, the other half did do Dynavision training, and they wanted to see um, you know, what happened uh, in their on-field performance between these two groups. So they said at the end of the experiment, the group who used Dynavision was better than the control group at Dynavision. That makes sense. If you practice Dynavision, you'll get better at it. The control group, they just did it at the start and at the end, and they didn't do as well as the group that practiced it. Sure, you learn Dynavision, but the whole thing here we're supposed to see is that that should transfer to uh, their field hockey performance. And what we've said so far, that doesn't seem to make sense, right? This is a different generalized motor program, so we should see no transfer, just like you know Michael Jordan going from you know basketball to baseball. So uh, I can't remember if it's in the abstract or not, but when they looked at a transfer task, so it was good they had transfer, a lot of the studies on Dynavision study did not, so they couldn't differentiate performance from learning, here they did. They said, we could not find statistically significant improvements for either group. So when they looked at these two groups, and they said, hey, after all this Dynavision practice, was either group better at field hockey? No, didn't make a difference. The interesting thing is that Dynavision has this article on their website. And, you know, kudos to them for, for having it there. But the problem is, is that if you're deciding, hey, should I use Dynavision? You click on their website, you click on research, and there's this plethora of studies. You're probably like, oh, it must work. There's actual research on it. And, you know, this title says, oh, the impact of sports vision training. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, you really have to read it. And, which, you know, well, research is not necessarily fun to read. It takes, you know, the right kind of person to enjoy research and that may not be the same type of person who's, who's trying to be a competitive field hockey player. And the other thing is, uh, even if you do read the whole thing, if you don't have the background knowledge that we have now about how to do a motor learning experiment, uh, you might not realize that they're missing critical things, so this study wasn't, but a lot of the other studies didn't have a control group. They didn't have retention or transfer. And you know, right there, that I would say that study is basically uh, worthless. This one, had those important things, and, and with those, they said, yeah, Dynavision doesn't work, and you know, this is actually on uh, Dynavision's website, which is kind of ironic. I don't mean to pick on Dynavision too much. I used it because, uh, one, I, I've, I've, I've used it before uh, in research, uh, 
uh, looking at executive function not as a way to say uh, improve at at field hockey um, but there are many products like this that are that are targeted at a, a, a athletes or other elite performers suggesting that it will it will give them the edge it will allow them to to transfer from one generalized motor program to another and by now hopefully after all these examples we should know that that you know that's basically ridiculous it I won't say it never happens um, but we don't have good evidence of that ever happening consistently <laughs> So if you'd like to do some practice questions at this point, there are a few on the power law and retention and our, our latest topic, uh, transfer. So let's look at our last topic and it's to answer you know, the most important question, how do we learn motor skills? And we're going to look at a prop popular theory for this, it's called schema theory. It's been around for a while now. And it's a really neat combination of kind of what we know so far about learning and also generalized motor programs. So schema theory also talks about, you know, what's happening in procedural memory. So we said, yeah, you know, you learn a skill, it's in procedural memory, and this gets a little more specific in saying, hey, within procedural memory, there are two types of memory. We have our recall memory and our recognition memory. Now our recall memory, this is what produces the action. So you have to you know, load this or extract it from memory before the movement, and then you use it to perform the action. Now schema theory, I think came a bit before the idea of generalized motor programs. Um, so at that point it was just called recall memory. Now we probably call that the generalized motor program. So I'll probably use both of those synonymously through the next few slides. So that's recall memory or that's our generalized motor program and we already know quite a bit about that. Well what's the recognition memory? This evaluates the movement correctness. This is used typically after but it can also be during the movement. What this does is it evaluates the feedback produced by the movement and it tells the participant was the movement correct or as intended or did something go wrong? And we'll look more at uh, these two types of memory. You know, generalized motor programs we already know a bit about. The idea of recognition memory is, is newer for us. So recall memory, generalized motor program. Within schema though, it talked a little more specifically about the idea of parameters and invariant features. And here it said there are really two things at play. One, the initial conditions. So before you make the movement, you know, what sort of initial conditions are we in? We'll look at an example of this soon. And then two, the parameters. You know, we need to set the parameters for the movement we want to make. So parameters we've seen, initial conditions, uh, new for us. Recognition memory, there's two more sources of information here. Sorry, I forgot to mention these. These are the four sources of information that are integrated with these two types of memory. First, we have the environmental outcomes. So if you throw a baseball, the environmental outcome is the ball traveling through the air, uh, the flight it takes, and how far it goes. So that's the result of the movement. So if we uh, think about a free throw situation here, uh, this player shot a free throw, and the environmental outcome is a miss. <laughs> you know, he, he's, he's missed the basket. The other thing, the other outcome, are the sensory consequences. So how did that movement feel? So if we think about a base, uh, sorry, basketball example still, so if you've played basketball a bit, there are times maybe when you've shot the ball and you can tell right away that it's a good shot. Or you maybe can tell that, no, that was way off. And that's your recognition memory. It's recognizing the sensory feedback coming in and saying, yes, that was good, or no, it wasn't, you know, even before you see the actual environmental outcome of the movement. This can be how it looked, it felt, it can even be sounded. So a baseball is a good example here, or tennis. Uh, when you hit the baseball or the tennis ball in the sweet spot of the bat or the racket, it has a different sound to it. And from that alone, you can say, ooh, you know, that was a good sound. Uh, my recognition memory is telling me that I, uh, 
I've hit the ball, uh, be it baseball or tennis, uh, well. So let's put some examples to this. Let's look at a, a full example of, of schema theory. So let's run with the baseball example. So you're going to throw a baseball and you need to uh, set the parameters. So you say, okay, the parameter in this case is related to say the distance. So we need to, to scale our relative force. And then what will happen based on the relative force is that ball will travel a certain distance. And here we see examples of individual trials. So on this trial, you can see there was you know, moderate force or medium force, and that allowed the ball, the baseball, to travel a medium distance. So that's one trial, and that kind of gets saved as part of your recall memory. Then maybe on another trial, there was much more force. We've got high force, and what happens to the ball? Obviously, it's going to travel a much longer distance. And with practice, we get these individual trials that form the recall memory. And here we can think of it as the relationship between relative force and distance. So how does this change with practice? Well, let's say you've thrown a baseball 10 times. Well, you've got these 10 different examples of how you know, force relates to distance or you know, any parameter relating to the outcome. And after 10 trials, you have kind of a basic relationship forming between force and distance. If you then do a lot more practice, so you know, 50 trials or, or maybe even 5 million trials, with increased individual trials, what we end up building is a better or a more refined relationship between, say, force and distance. And here I think I tried to show that these lines, I wish I'd put the equations on for them, uh, because here it, it, it does change. It's not, you know, after 10 trials, you haven't necessarily figured out, uh, you don't have a perfect recall memory. That recall memory gets better and better with more and more practice. Okay, what about initial conditions? So that's really just parameters, which we all already know a lot about. And in this case, uh, you know, these are generalized motor programs, and you might use the same generalized motor program to throw a baseball, a tennis ball, or a wiffle ball. And depending on which one you're throwing, that could be considered an initial condition. So let's say you pick up a tennis ball, that's the initial condition, and you throw a tennis ball, and you might have these three different recall memories. One uh, for if you're throwing a wiffle ball, another if the initial condition says I'm throwing a tennis ball, and a third if the initial condition is hey, I'm throwing a baseball. So in this case, we want to throw a tennis ball, and let's say we want to throw it 22 feet. So we're going to go uh, from that 22 foot movement outcome to the initial condition. So we go till we hit line two here for our tennis ball. That allows us to figure out what our parameters should be based on the recall memory uh, for the initial condition of throwing a tennis ball. And it doesn't have to be a different type of ball. The initial condition could be the amount of wind. So maybe we have one recall memory for no wind. Okay, I need you know, this much force to throw at 22 feet. Maybe there's a tailwind. And so the initial conditions have changed and now you don't need as much force. Um, the parameters change, but it'll still go 22 feet. And conversely, maybe there's a headwind. So we got to fight against the wind. So the initial conditions are different. And to throw at 22 feet, we're going to tweak the parameters. So that's our recall memory and how parameters go into it, which we've seen before, but also this concept of initial conditions. What about the recognition memory? And this is newer. We haven't really seen this uh, before as, um, as we had seen generalized motor programs before. So let's run with this example. Uh, of the initial conditions throwing a tennis ball. So this is our, it's not our recall memory now, this is our recognition memory. We're going to say, hey, you know, we want to throw it 22 feet. So we'll say that's, you know, point A on this line. So we're going to go up to our recognition memory that says, yeah, if you want to throw it 22 feet and it's a tennis ball, you know, that's here. Now when we go over, instead of this telling us what the parameters are going to be, it's going to tell us what the sensory consequences will be. And this would be the environmental consequences. So the ball should 
land 22 feet away? <laughs> and what does it feel like when we throw uh, the ball 22 feet? Now, when we make that movement, if these expected sensory consequences are different than the actual or the action sensory consequences, then that triggers our brain to say, hey, that's an error. I was expecting these consequences. It should feel like this. It should go 22 feet. And it felt weird, and it only went 10 feet. That uh, kicks in kind of closed loop control for motor learning. Then on subsequent trials, you know, we can make uh, a correction. Or that might trigger learning to our recognition and recall memories. Maybe what we expected wasn't very refined yet, and we're going to update our recall and recognition memory from what has occurred on this trial. So schema theory, we've got two types of memory, and the idea is that these both are uh, exists within procedural memory. We have our recall memory, which we can really think of as our generalized motor program, which of course has parameters, you know, invariant features didn't really play a role here, but those would, would still exist. And then the new thing is that we also need to kind of determine the initial conditions. You know, what type of ball are we throwing? Uh, what's uh, the wind like? In other things, this could be what sort of surface are we on? If we're about to run on a slippery surface or a hard surface, that would change you know, what we expect to happen. And then the new side of this is there's also this recognition memory. Um, this allows us to predict the environmental outcomes. So you know, what happens when we make this movement? And then what does it feel like when we make the movement, the sensory consequences? And when the actual movement differs from our predicted environmental or sensory outcomes, that's when we know that an error has occurred and that can either lead to, to learning, refinement of our recall and recognition memory, or changing parameters on the next trial. So schema theory is, is fairly well accepted, it's fairly uh, widely supported with lots of research and that's why we call it a theory and not say uh, a hypothesis. A hypothesis is just something that uh, you know we're, we're predicting that you know makes sense uh, but we don't know yet whether it's true. When something becomes a theory that's when there's a lot of evidence uh, that uh, supports it. And there's a lot of confusion in popular culture around the difference between a hypothesis and a theory. And one example of that is a conspiracy theory. So it really should be a conspiracy hypothesis because it's just something that you know makes sense maybe kind of in an out uh, out of <laughs> in an unusual way um, there's some you know logic to it but we don't know whether or not it's true so it's kind of an oxymoron to say a conspiracy theory and yet you know that's the uh, the, the terminology that we use and you know I probably uh, would use it well but um, now that I've, I've thought about that, it, if, if, if I ever do say that, I, you know, it kind of makes my, my ears twinge because I'm like, well, no, it's not a conspiracy theory, it's a conspiracy hypothesis. Anyways, bit of a digression. <laughs> so schema theory, um, it, it, it has a lot of support for it, but we're going to look at an exception to it. And just like the exceptions to say Fitts Law or Hicks Law, they're small. You know, 99% of the time it does work, 1% of the time there's this exception. Um, so even though we're focusing on the exception, know that it's, you know, the exception, it's not the rule. Because if there were only exceptions, we wouldn't call it a theory. So when we talked about uh, the recall memory or the recognition memory, the idea is that, you know, you do this individual practice and what we save is this relationship between the, the outcome and either, you know, the parameter or the, the consequences. And, you know, you might practice, um, you know, at this range or, you know, you might practice sort of in this range, you know, higher force or lower force. But what we save overall is just this, this one relationship. Where we see the exception is in a highly practiced skills at a very specific situation. And the first example we're going to look at is the set shot. 
So like a free throw shot in basketball and the free throw line is 15 feet. So if a player practices free throws or set shots, you know, they go to the, the free throw line and they shoot free throws. You know, I, I don't think basketball players say, oh, well, I'm gonna practice free throws at 20 feet or at 10 feet, at least that's not something I've heard of. If, if, if you're a basketball player and you do that, you know, let me know. Um, but I think if you, conventional wisdom, if you wanna get better at set shots, you practice at 15 feet. And what that would look like, if we're talking about the recall memory, is a massive amount of practice at 15 feet. Uh, and, and you know maybe every once in a while, or maybe never, would you have practice at these, these other movement outcomes. But schema theory still says, you know, you're just gonna have this, this one recall memory or one recognition memory. There could be a few based on initial parameters, um, but you're gonna use this relationship regardless of whether you're at 12 feet or 10 feet or 20 feet, even though you don't normally do that. So in this very interesting study, what they did is they got university basketball players, so you know, fairly experienced basketball players, and they had them do set shots from nine feet. Uh, I think they went back in, in one foot distances to all the way to 21 feet. And this would be a little odd for the basketball players because they're used to doing set shots at 15 feet. Now they didn't let them switch to a jump shot, which you would practice all over the court, they always had to do this set shot, this free throw uh, movement from these different distances. And what they looked at is the percentages of shots made at each distance. Now shooting from nine feet is easier than shooting from 21 feet. So these, uh, these players, they should have higher percentages at nine feet. And then as it gets further and further, their shooting percentage should decrease. And what they're curious about is what does this decrease look like and does anything weird or special happen at 15 feet where they've had massive amounts of practice? Now schema theory just says that it should decrease with distance because you're always using the same recall recognition memory. 15 feet, even though you've got a lot of practice there, you still have one recall memory, one recognition memory, and you should be using that uh, regardless of um, the distance if it's the distance where you typically practice or if it's a different distance. So here's what they found. So here the players, oh, it looks like they went every two feet. So you're shooting from nine feet and they made about 85% of their shots. And the further back they go, uh, you can see that it's a harder task and the percentage decreases. But look at this one weird data point here that doesn't fall in line with the rest. And this is at 15 feet, the typical free throw length. And here, accuracy is higher than predicted from the other distances. Now this is an exception to schema theory. It's kind of saying that, hey, maybe you've got two recall or recognition memories. Uh, one for 15 feet where you usually shoot and then another one for all the other distances. And that's weird. Schema theory, um, sh it says it, it shouldn't work that way. Or you could think about it in terms of a generalized motor program. You know, here we've just changed the parameters and yet performance is, is vastly different. So it's like two generalized motor programs and that's weird. It doesn't make sense for generalized motor programs and it doesn't fit within schema theory. In a second experiment, they said, okay, well, do you always see this at 15 feet? What if we have players do jump shots? Now jump shots, you do practice at all sorts of distance because at the game you might do you know, a two foot jump shot, but you also might do a, you know, a three pointer jump shot. And here they expected the same sort of pattern where you know, close up, you should have high accuracy and it should decrease as you go. And schema theory predicts that 15 feet should look like all the other distances. And in this case, the data actually supported schema theory in that 15 feet did fall in line with the other, um, with, with the decreasing percentage as distance increased. So for jump shots, we do see schema theory. It looks like you've got this one recognition, this one uh, recall memory, but there's something about massive practice in a specific situation that causes a difference where you're, you know, better than predicted by you know, further and closer distances. 
So jump shots, or uh, sorry, not jump shots, set shots are, um, jump shots are shown there, yes, <laughs> Thank, okay, this is right. Uh, jump shots do support schema theory, set shots or free throws do not. It's not just uh, jump shots, or sorry, it's not just set shots that violate schema theory, any sort of task where you have massive practice in a narrow context. And these for some reason have been labeled as e-special skills. Uh, it's, a, it's an older term, so it's, you know, it's not supposed to mean electronic special skills, you know, like, like email. <laughs> uh, but an e-special skill, the definition is, is massive practi practice in a narrow context. So set shot, yeah, you practice probably all the time at 15 feet. Another example, though, is pitching from the mound. So when a pitcher practices, uh, when they're younger, the mound's a little closer. Actually, there's not even a mound uh, or, well, Let's see there. Oh, I don't know my baseball terminology because the mound, the whole thing, you know, occurs in, in, in older ages. At first, you know, it's just flat with the, the rubber. See, I don't know the name of it. <laughs> Anyways, it doesn't take uh, too long for baseball pitchers to always be pitching at uh, the same distance. And if we look at how accurate are they from pitching from the mound, they'll be more accurate than predicted if we have them pitch further and closer, so you imagine you know, the, that basketball line that we saw, uh, and at pitching at the mound, they would be better than predicted by those other distances. Let's look at a second example, archery. It's also considered an e-special skill. So in this study, they looked at indoor archers, and in these specific indoor archers, the distance they competed at, and I don't know if this is the case for all indoor archery, but it was 18 meters. And what they asked them to do was shoot you know, closer, 15 meters, 16, 17, their standard distance or further than what they normally practiced. They shot nine shots. I don't know if that's typical in these competitions. And they just recorded the mean score of those shots, which could be you know, zero if they missed uh, the target uh, nine times, or if they hit the center nine times, they would have a mean of 10. So the higher the score, the better. And what schema theory predicts and what is logical is when you're close, you should have a higher score. And as you go further and further back, your score should drop. If archery is an e-special skill, we should see this boost in performance or higher than expected performance at the standard indoor distance where they've had massive amounts of practice. And that is what they found. So you can see her shoot at uh, 15 feet, closest distance, and scores are really high. I feel like I've made them, did I say, oh, nine arrows out of 10. I was like, how did they score over nine? Well, it was out of 10. So they do really well, and their score decreases the further back they go. But you can see here, there's this one outlier, and where does that occur? At 18 meters the standard distance where they would practice probably all the time. And just like basketball players who practice the set shot, I think they probably always do that from 15 feet. Archers, as far as I know, when they practice, if they're competed 18 feet, sorry, 18 meters, they would practice at 18 meters. And we've already talked about why that's logical, because that will optimize uh, transfer from practice to the game. But that massive amount of practice in this narrow context, what we call an e-special skill, is an exception to schema theory and even kind of our notions about generalized motor programs. So finally, uh, in the practice questions, there are some questions that focus in on schema theory and e-special skills, which are an exception uh, to schema theory. All right, well, thank you everyone. That is our final module. Uh, it's been great having you in the course. Some of you I've, I've been able to meet uh, online over email. Um, others of you um, I didn't get the chance to meet, but if you are on campus in the next semester, feel free to, to swing by and, and say hello.